Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. It's a beautiful day outside today. I don't know if you guys will be able to see out the windows here. It's a little bit breezy, but our high is 78, which is amazing. And yesterday was 80 and we are going to creep back up to 98 by the end of the week, but we are just soaking it in and loving it. So it makes me in a very good mood. So we are just going to jump right into the videos from last week. What do I have in my shirt? Oh, I got batteries. Yeah. Hold on. <laughs> and a credit card just in case, you know? I haven't even gone anywhere today. First video was update tour of flower and veggies planted from seed in July. And in that video, I just gave you a quick tour of how everything was doing out in the cut flower garden that I planted in mid-July. So there were 10 different flowers and then a bunch of different fall crops out there. Everything's looking great. However, we just had a huge windstorm on Saturday night and it went from 95 down to 80. When we have a 15 degree drop in temperature, it's cheddar, um, that usually means a huge windstorm and everything out there like Sunday was a little bit of a hard day for me because I felt like it always happens when you feel like everything in the garden looks so nice and everything was blooming and beautiful and then all of a sudden like the wind comes through and snaps some of your sunflowers in half and lays corn over like my new corn. It's all standing back up today because it was a lot younger than my other corn was when that corn fell down. But anyway, everything is fine um, and it ended up bouncing back, but it is still breezy today. Anyway, that was a total tangent, but everything's looking good. Um, first question was from Kathleen. Have you harvested any fruit or vegetables other than the watermelon? The garden is looking awesome. Yes, in fact, um, today I'm kind of still a little bit dirty. I'm actually stained from the tomatoes because I harvested tomatoes and carrots and beans. Um, and I filmed it so you guys will be able to see that maybe even before you see this video I'm not sure what order things will come out, but we have been harvesting things and eating them and it's pretty amazing I'm loving it. Christy said everything is looking so good guys. Thank you Super encouraging to see your progress with all your later plantings from seeds timing has never been my strong suit Same and I too got some seeds started later Question at the end of this growing season, will you be pulling all of your new plants out of the ground or tilling them into the soil to add nitrogen? I think like the vine, I, I think some of them are good contenders. Like the vine crops are good because they're not all woody. I think like the big massive tomato, you know, they get like trunks on them. And then um, like the sunflowers are stiff. Like they're really, really hard trunks and they have a huge root ball. And I don't know that that would be very easy to till. And I think they would actually remain in kind of chunks. Um, so some of them we'll probably leave and, and till in. All right, what are you doing? He's like climbing up me. And some of them we may till in. I don't know where I was at in that sentence, but anyway, I don't know. We'll probably uh, make a video about it or at least let you guys know what we decide to do. Uh, Cheryl said, everything looks so beautiful to me. I wondered if you have ever dealt with tomato blight. I'm in zone 7B. I had to pull everything from my raised beds because of it. Now I just read an article that said not to plant anything in that space for three years. Yeah, and I think that that's probably right. I know it's some certain time span. It's good to rotate your crops anyway, especially tomatoes. I remember that specifically when I was a kid. Alliums, like onions and garlic and tomatoes. My parents always made sure to have those in different spaces of the garden every single year. And I, I don't make like a huge effort, but it's always on my mind and I always shift things around a little bit just because I like change. Um, but I think that that's just a good practice to maintain because every crop will either add something to the soil or take something away. And like alliums are huge, heavy feeders. And if you put them in the same spot every single year, that like, soon that soil is gonna have nothing in it if unless you keep adding stuff into it. But I've actually never dealt with tomato blight and I'm not sure, like I'm not super, super knowledgeable about it just because I've never dealt with it. And I don't know if it's um, due to our dry, hot climate that maybe we haven't, but um, I'm thankful for that. I'm sorry you're dealing with that. Jennifer said, what do you fertilize your dahlias with? Is it the same as your other annuals? I fertilized them with the Espoma organic flower tone. And you guys, we fertilized them within five or six days. I noticed a tremendous shift, like a tremendous boom in growth. And I hadn't fertilized them up to that point. I mean, we put uh, land and sea and biotone in the planting area when we put the tubers in the ground. And so that's a, always a really good start, but they were looking really short. And I thought, well, we just got them in the ground really late and they're not gonna put on a ton of vertical growth. And then enter flower tone, watered it in and those plants have just grown like crazy. It is different than the fertilizer we give other annuals, which is a weekly water soluble fertilizer. And it's more of a quick shot, like it just quickly feeds your plants because they are like super tunias, they're powerhouse blooming plants and they're, they usually have more blooms than leaves on them all season long. And so they need a tremendous amount of nutrients. 
Flower tone is an organic, it's a slower release, slower breakdown, slowly feeding the plants, which the dahlias, you know, for much of the season, they're putting on leafy growth, and then they're just now entering, for me anyway, they're entering into their um, bloom season. Um, so I thought it was a good idea just to give them a little bit of a recharge, and it's worked great. Alyssa said, I'm really looking forward to seeing you use these flowers in arrangements. I was wondering if you've ever used aviary wire as a frog. Uh, aviary wire, uh, which I'm assuming is different than chicken wire, right? It usually comes in small grid squares. That's a really interesting suggestion. I'll have to look that up. I think I've tried hardware cloth, which is a small grid, but hardware cloth is so stiff. It's really hard to mold. Like, uh, like chicken wire is really easy to mold. But aviary wire, I'm guessing, is probably like for smaller bird cages. I don't know, I'll look into that. Thanks for the suggestion. Our next video was a seed haul. We had a really kind of crummy day outside with all the fires um, that were going on near, near us. The air quality was horribly bad um, and it was really hot. So like hot, smoky air. I thought this is the perfect day to be inside. I just kind of gathered up all my seeds anyway. I've been working on it for the last couple of weeks. I had my seed inventory done, so I thought I'd just go through what I'm planning for 2021 at this point. Since then, I do have five new packets of seed because that's what I do, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, and I can't help it. Uh, so I will continually be adding to that inventory, but it just kind of gave you an idea or I wanted to give you the idea of kind of how I'm going about it. And I'm constantly messing or tweaking with the system, um, trying to make it a little bit better every single year or a little bit more usable for me. And everybody is so different. Like my brain works so differently than um, other seed organization methods that I've seen. Like I need to organize based on month. I need it to be based on date, not like all my annual flowers in one section. I have them like that now, but I'm gonna work on doing like, these are the annuals I need to direct seed in April. These are the annuals I need to direct seed in Ma uh, May so that I know I can get into my organization system and I know exactly what I need to do that month instead of having to plow through all the seeds and look for each one and then take them out. You know what I mean? So anyway. Uh, Donna said, I heard that seeds should be kept in a dark, cool place to prolong the potency of the seeds. Is this what you do with your containers? Mine, um, dark, cool place is great. Like um, we always say, as long as you keep them dry um, and you keep them like in a drawer somewhere in your house. I mean, I keep mine in a dark closet in our upstairs and it works great. Next question is from Judy. Uh oh, did you warn Johnny Seeds or Florette you were going to be talking about them? I'm imagining that every time you promote a product, their sales go through the roof. I love long videos, so no worries there for me. Um, I did not warn them. I did tell my parents though, I was like, you know, maybe have a little bit of extra seed on hand just in case you get a few orders. Um, they've just recently started their seed website like in the last year or two and it's going really well and they're just kind of trying to work kinks out and they're going really slowly, um, which you know, makes it a little bit easier instead of, I don't know, too much too fast. But um, no, I didn't warn anybody. So I don't know how it went for Flora or Johnny's. I really focused on Johnny's because I hadn't got my, I haven't got my Flora stuff. I got I have a box right behind Aaron on the patio today. So that'll be exciting. Maybe we'll do a quick unboxing. Uh, Lisa said, how many, if any of those pumpkins will you actually eat? Or are they primarily for decorating? I probably won't eat any of the actual pumpkins. We eat more squash. So there's sweet meat and there's um, oh boy, there's a lot out there. What else is out there? Acorn, um, butternut, we eat a lot of those kinds of things and I will store several of those and then we'll be decorating. And I'm hoping I have enough to at least give some to family members. I don't know though. I was walking around in there the other night and I don't know if it's gonna be a situation like with the watermelon. I got into the vines and I realized how many watermelons I actually had and maybe it'll be like that with the pumpkins but I felt like I was seeing the same variety everywhere out there. Like I have one vine of something that grows like kind of like a gourd almost, huge, some of them are huge, but it's like it's grown the entire distance of the entire area out there and I just have this fruit everywhere. <laughs> so hopefully I have more than just that one variety that come up that I can uh, harvest. I don't know, it'll be really interesting. I'm gonna space things out much better next year. Everything, the tomatoes, the corn, the vines, everything, even though I felt like I was giving it so much room, it still is very tight. Lacey said, how do you decide what to start in seed trays versus directly in the ground? I go by the recommendation on the back of the seed packet. It'll usually tell you uh, directions for both ways, starting inside or sowing outside, and then it'll say recommended underneath one of those, and I always go by the recommended. And I have really never been steered wrong that way. I've never grown anything by seed intentionally, but would love to give many of these varieties a try. 
I'm curious then about what to invest in if I need to start them in trays. So I think the most important thing is light. It's so, so important to the health of your plants. And you really can go um, like real expensive or you can keep it really simple. I would just make sure, I mean, even if you have a super sunny windowsill, that would work as long as you can continually rotate your plants so they're not stretching for the light. But I think grow lights are essential. I don't think seedling heat mats are. Um, I have them and rarely, rarely use them, even if they call for bottom heat. I'm like, well, I'm starting these inside. It's really warm in here, it'll be fine. And maybe like the bottom heat would help them germinate a tiny bit faster, but I rarely use them. Um, anyway, make sure you have the right kind of soil. You wanna make sure to have the seed starting mix, not regular potting so soil, not garden soil. Those are too heavy. Um, and then I always find having a fan, a rotating fan in the room really helps too. It makes the seedlings nice and strong. Um, and then, what else? Any other equipment that I'm missing, Erin? That's pretty much it. Yeah, but we will link down below our winter sowing method um, of growing seeds where you really need nothing. Um, you just recycle containers like milk jugs or water jugs or orange juice containers or whatever um, that are either clear or like a, uh, it can be a plastic that's kind of modeled. I used water jugs where light can still penetrate and can get in, but you start these seeds out really early in the year and it takes very little work and it really, I did have quite a bit of success with it this year. I prefer starting mine inside because it's a more organized and tidy way of doing it. Um, but you don't need much to do the winter sowing method. So you might check that out. Angie said, makes me want to plant. Do you worry about seeds getting old or when will sites come out with the new seeds for 2021? I don't worry about seeds getting old. It takes a lot of years for seed to go bad. There are some seeds, I think like alliums, tomatoes. Um, there's a certain handful that that deteriorate a little bit quicker. And I'll try to find a chart. I think the Farmer's Almanac had a chart on how long, how many years each type of seed typically lasts. And basically like I'll sometimes use seed that I've had for eight years. Knowing that I'll put extra seeds in the ground because I know the germination rate just won't be as high. Like maybe when I bought the seeds, the packet said it was a 98% germination rate or 95% germ germination rate. Eight years later, it might be like 60% or 70% germination rate, depending on what kind of seed it is and how fast it loses its, loses its viability. So you just know that and you put twice the amount of seeds in the ground and then you make sure to have something germinate if that makes sense. But we'll try to find that chart and link it down below because it is very helpful. Next video was a second arrangement. Yeah, I picked up a really pretty, it's like a thin metal urn down at the garden center. And I was just in the mood to do a succulent arrangement. Sometimes it takes a while because I feel like I have to have the right container and then um, I'm not keeping as many plants upstairs in our plant room because I used so much of my plant room for seed starting that I kind of farmed out a lot of the plants I had up there to friends and family. Um, so I've got like two trays of plants up there and so I needed to gather up some fresh stuff and I it just happened to like all come together this last week. So. Michelle said, your arrangement is lovely, thank you. You could start out with a rusty old coffee can and make it beautiful. You, oh, oh, that's sweet, Erin. Erin always puts the sweet ones in there. Thank you, Michelle, that's a really sweet comment. I think you should actually do that. Do a rusty old coffee can? Yeah. I don't know. I think Michelle has more confidence in me than I have in myself, maybe. <laughs> Linda said, it looks fabulous. What do you use to water? Um, so it's outside and I just use a really slow hose. Like it's been several days, so I did use some cuttings in that arrangement and they were fresh. I didn't let them heal, which means if you're using those in with rooted succulents, you really need to hold off on watering for like five, six, seven days. Let those cuttings have a chance to heal, which they still will inside the soil because this dry soil still has oxygen in it. It just takes longer than for them to heal as opposed to like sitting out um, at, to the air, like complete air all the way around that cut for them to heal. Um, so it's been several days and I just use a slow hose. I mean, I take the hose around to water stuff in that area anyway. So I just turn it on really low and just kind of like sprinkle it around and it works really well. Inside, I would just use a watering can and be really careful. You could also use a syringe. I talk about that all the time. We've got those huge syringes and it makes it very easy for targeted water. And honestly, that'd probably be the best way for me to do it because we have such hard water that if I were to continue to water it with the hose, I just know it's short term right now. But if I were to continue to do that, it would probably start getting hard water buildup and then it wouldn't look as good. Karen said, I'm in zone seven. Do those succulents tolerate winters outside or do you bring them in for winter? Uh, you know what? Most of those are tender succulents. Usually 40 degrees is kind of my, my cutoff. When it starts getting right at 40 degrees, I start bringing all my tender stuff inside. I don't know what zone seven is. Is that a 10 degrees? That's zero degrees, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, you need to bring them inside for winter. Uh, Marina said the arrangement is really beautiful, but speaking of bug-free plants, how do you deal with fungus gnats once you bring them inside? Okay, the best way that I've dealt with some fungus gnats is to um, get those sticky traps. <laughs> like, that's the best way. I've tried lots of different kinds of sprays. You can, there's a lot of different routes you can go. So you can take the plants out of the soil, like take remove as much soil from around the, the roots as you can, rinse the roots, repot them in fresh soil, um, <clears throat> just so that you're eliminating any eggs that are harboring over in the soil. Uh, but you'd have to do that with anywhere that there's a problem. Like if you have a bunch of plants in the room and you're not sure where they're coming from, you would that would mean like a total. For me, that was, I couldn't do that up in our plant room. I've had fungus gnats one time and it wasn't horrible, but I just got those sticky, they're like yellow sheets of paper that are super sticky. They stick to everything, like my hair, um, my clothes, and they leave a residue. I, I, they're kind of a pain to use, <laughs> honestly but they are a really good way. They just like attract the fungus gnats and they stick to the boards and then they die. Um, and you eventually, the longer you have them in there, the more you weed out the population. Seems to do pretty good. And then you do wanna make sure to not keep your plants super soggy because that is perfect breeding ground uh, for fungus gnats. So you wanna make sure to let things dry out just a little bit in between. Jake said, hey Laura, since your luck with Calibrecoa, even in containers has been spotty, too much water, and since my area in New Jersey gets more than 10 inches um, over the national average of precipitation, have you considered or heard of anyone using the cactus potting soil with super bells in your area and super tunias in my area? Just curious if that soil can be used to combat too much water. That's an interesting yeah, idea. Yeah, really interesting. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that, Jake. Like I, I think that that would be, cause I'm about ready to write super bells off completely um, because they're so incompatible with every other plant that we plant in this area because we have so little water and we have to irrigate everything um, and super bells want such dry feet. I think that would be interesting to like test yeah, that should, out. We should try that next year. Yeah, sure. we should. Yeah, yeah, add that to the list. Next video is planting a new variety of hydrangea. In the back corner, it's like the southwest corner of our new property, we have a red point maple and we just planted six of the new hydrangea called Quick Fire Fab. I'm really excited about it because the pictures are glorious. Um, it is a new, I think you can get it. I think you can order it right now, but I think it's technically a new variety for next year. And um, it's a really early blooming variety. And I'm just so excited because I think it's going to fill up that corner beautifully. Wendy said, I live in Southern Utah and it's really hot here too, high desert. How long do you run your drip for? So it really depends on what area we are at in our garden and if the hydrangeas are sharing the zone with some other things. Um, but typically if we can get away with running our drip for one hour every day, that's how long we run it in the hot part of the summer. Um, and if a hydrangea is not uh, in an area, like if it's included with maybe lavender or other things that can't handle that much water, then we give them supplemental water. When we walk around with our hoses every day, we just put a little water, extra water at the root ball, knowing they're not getting quite as much as maybe some of the other hydrangeas in our garden. Shelly said, those hydrangeas are beautiful. I love the way their colors progress as they age. Do you think they would dry as nicely as other hydrangea types and retain that beautiful color? This corner is looking amazing and such a strong rounding spot on your new property. Um, I do think that they would uh, dry and retain their color. Most paniculatas will. Uh, Carson said, I saw you adding soil acidifier in. I thought you only put that in for blue hydrangeas. It turns hydrangeas blue. Can you elaborate? Uh, yeah, and I know that that was kind of a confusing thing. We explained all of the amendments at the very end of the video. What we are doing, because paniculated hydrangeas, they don't change color. Doesn't matter what you put in the soil, whatever color they are, that is the color they will be when they bloom. They're not like a mac macrophylla, like a big leaf hydrangea or a mountain hydrangea, which is hydrangea serrata. Those will differ in bloom color based on soil pH. Um, and we have very high pH soil, but the reason why we're using soil acidifier is we're trying to combat chlorosis or iron deficiency. Because our soil is so high pH, it binds up nutrients in the soil and makes them unavailable to plants. So while there may be iron in our soil, the plants can't utilize it because it's so bound up. So if we can condition that soil by adding in soil acidifier and we use land and sea compost, which is an, uh, kind of a more acidic base compost, if we can add those things in, bring that soil pH down and pH down and help unlock those nutrients so the plant can actually utilize them, then we hopefully won't deal with the chlorosis issues that we're seeing in our garden, which are particularly bad this year. So we are going to be really hitting stuff hard with the land and sea and with the soil acidifier. So you guys will probably see that quite a bit. 
and that's the reason for that. Uh, Virginia said, I ordered line lights from PW, PW in the spring. They were only in small containers, so I bumped them up to one gallon. They are looking leggy. Can they go in the ground even though they are small? Absolutely, get them in the ground, get them established. They will grow fast. I know when you get those um, little plants, you think, oh my goodness, this is never gonna be like what I see in the picture. Just give it a few years. I mean, the we even talked about it in a video this week. The first year they sleep, the second year they creep, the third year they leap. Um, so I think get it in the ground, um, get some starter fertilizer on it, keep it well watered, and it'll take off in no time. Uh, Grace said, what about doing some natives or a native garden in the new space? I think it would be a great place to put some bird feeders or a small pond. It could be great for Benjamin. And I think I know where you're going with that, Grace. Like I can kind of see a vision in my head of what you mean by a native garden, but I never really know exactly what people mean when they say native. We live in the high desert. So what's native here? Nothing. Sagebrush. Yeah. <laughs> Brown grass that dries and burns in the summer. Um, maybe a juniper if you get high enough. It, they wouldn't grow here though. Like if you got high enough in the ooh, in the hills, you would start seeing juniper spotting around right. a little bit. But but locally, there's no trees that grow natively mm -mm. except for near a river. Right. Which there are not. I mean, yes. Yeah. A, a I know. So if you see a tag on a plant that says native to the U.S., I'm like, well, the U.S. or the native to North America, it's a pretty big area. Like where exactly is that native? Because I bet you it's not native in my area. So I think for us, we'd have to attack it like drought tolerant plants like caryopteris sure. and Russian sage and like those things that don't lavender. require lavender, those things that don't require a ton of water that attract pollinators, like kind of meadowish but very low maintenance. Yeah. So I think that that's maybe how we would have to take it. But we, yeah, native here is, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Amy said, Laura, I can't seem to find the land and see compost. I know, it's, it's a new product this year, right? It's a new, yeah, they're, they're working on their distribution. distribution. Yeah. yeah, so this year I think it was very, it was distrib distributed, distributed on the East Coast mainly, and they're working on pushing it further West. Um, so I know, and once you get it, once you find it, buy it. <laughs> I, I swear that stuff is like magic. Do you know of anyone that sells online and have it delivered? You, you might check um, True Value. Check True Value. We have ordered several things of Espoma through True Value and they'll have it drop shipped to the store and you can go pick it up down there. That might be an option, so check into that. Uh, next video was update tour of the flower beds we planted for our friends, <laughs> which I did not want to do that video. I'm going to be completely honest. That didn't turn out like at all what I wanted it to turn out to look like, but we want to give you updates and maybe it's encouraging to you guys to see things that didn't really work out. Um, like I- I thought it was pretty. You did? Yeah, it was colorful. It was nice. Mm, I I don't know. I think next time I'm gonna I'm gonna rely far less on annuals and and do more for bone structure. I think though I was dealing with not very many things. I, I didn't have very many structural things at that point, remember? Like I I didn't have what I needed to put together. I had more annuals than I did perennials oh, at that time. Sure. Anyway, I was just trying to kind of work with I with what I had. Whoops. Um, and I, I kind of lamented about the Sun Credibles not performing very well, both there and here. And I mean, they're blooming and they're growing and here they're a little more full than they were down there. Um, but last year they just seemed to grow so tall and I'm lacking the height this year. So um, I did see lots of comments about how small the Sun Credibles were this year, but then we got a few messages as well showing us how amazing they're performing for other people. <laughs> so I don't think it's the plant. It must be something else. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. Christine said, I've seen so many of your videos where you've done some kind of irrigation system. They've been excellent and have made me feel like uh, even I can put one in. Awesome. But there's one thing that always stops me. After attaching the automatic system, do you turn on the faucet and leave it on the entire season? Yes. Night and day until the ir irrigation system is no longer needed. Yes. So it's just on all the time. Um, so like if you have a splitter, like in this case, the splitter each has an on off valve. So if you have one connected to a hose, of course you wanna turn that one off and that's where you actually turn it on if you need to access the hose, not at the faucet. So faucet stays on and then you forget about it until you blow out your system if it's attached to your irrigation system um, and not like a frost free or something. But, um, so, but then the um, drip system one is on all the time. So you just always have that on and you basically just don't touch it. That way it has access when it turns on, it has access to the water and can pull it. Charlotte said, uh, thanks for showing the update. Could you update the house you did with the boulders? We can't because um, our family members sold that house. <laughs> I was actually really excited. So my plans for this year was I was going to have some guys come up and um, kind of tip some of the rocks just slightly so I could 
uh, remove just a little bit of soil and sub them down just a tiny bit, but it was filling up so beautifully. And then my sister-in-law planted a bunch of bulbs, a bunch of them last fall. And so, and they moved out before they bloomed and we, we both drove by to take a look at them this spring. And so I was kind of sad about that, but dang. Sasha said, I've heard being pregnant can change your hair. Did your hair get straighter and that's why you cut it? My mom's hair got super curly when she was pregnant. Um, no, so I actually didn't have any plans on cutting my hair, except for I had this big chunk that was like bleaching out in the sun more than the rest of my hair and I had a ton of breakage. Like, and this was pre-pregnancy, like my hair was starting to get really damaged and I could grab a piece and I could go like this and then like watch all the broken hairs fall down. And so finally I was sitting down getting my hair like my grays covered the other day and my hair stylist was like, can we, can we cut it? <laughs> so she was sending me pictures of hair and I was just like, it's fine. As long as it falls below my shoulders still, it's fine. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> so she cut off, I think five or six inches right in between there. It does feel really healthy. It's way bigger of a pain to do. Uh, longer hair is way easier for me to do. I'm just not used to it yet, but it does feel better. It doesn't keep me less warm. It doesn't make me cooler or anything. Um, yeah. Uh, does anything make a pregnant woman feel cooler? No. Okay. Herman said, I've been watching for a few months now. I do have a question. How are your elephant ears that you planted? They are awesome. We should do an update, Erin, on those. Yeah. Like I can see some behind the Hebe fountain up here. The ones behind the chicken coop are amazing. They haven't put on, like they've put on some height, but like those stalks, the trunks are huge now. And they've put on side growth. Like I, it's hard to walk through there now. And I hope that they have time enough to put on some more vertical growth because that's what I was really hoping for. But they're eye catching. Linda said, is lemon coral sedum a perennial in Portland, Oregon? I bet you it is. I don't know what zone Portland is. Probably a seven. Yeah, and it's a, it's a zone seven lemon coral is. Let me, let me Google that really quick. Oh, Portland's an 8B. Yep, you're good with lemon coral. That'll be a perennial for you, for sure. The next video, this is the last video, was the Shade Mini Garden. We just put that up this morning. It was fun because I was in the mood. I haven't done a fairy garden in a really long time. Uh, and I haven't gotten any new pieces, and I think that's my problem because I, sometimes I get hung up on just having old stuff and it's hard for me to like reimagine sometimes different ways to use things. So, but I just kind of had like this little wave of like, oh, I don't need to have a ton of new things and I can build something from scraps that I find outside. Sometimes that's more of a challenge and it's more stretching for me and it's more fun. Um, Catherine said, I've admired your work table in many videos. What can you tell us about it? That is called the Gardener's Potting Bench from Gardener's Supply. We will link it down below. It is the perfect height. I really like it. It has a soil catch down below it um, and it has a shelf that you don't see, but there's a shelf down below where I've got a bunch of stuff like fertilizers and um, tools and extra soil and things like that. So anyway, I uh, will put a link down there so you can check it out if you want to. Rick said, do I see pansies on the table behind you? Yes, you do. I am like fully stocked on mums, cabbage and pansies at the moment. It's just that I am, I'm holding on because the temperature is climbing back up to 98. I'm just thinking that is, that is a little bit too hot to put my fall stuff out yet, even though I really, really want to. I might, I might, I don't know. I'm ready for it though. Veronica said about how long do these arrangements last before everything grows wild? It depends on the type. When I do a fairy garden with succulents, it'll stay like that forever, for like a year. We can enjoy a fairy garden like that. For the shade one, I would say like if I did it earlier on in the season, um, like let's say I did it May 1st, I think I wouldn't have to mess with it until fall. I think I would have it all season, but sometimes you need to be mindful. I did a fairy garden once I look back at it now, I'm like, oh, it was pretty at the time, but what did I put in that, Erin? Like super tunias maybe, and like lobelia, and angelonia, like things that get big. Um, don't know really what I was thinking when I did that one. She live and learn, it was real pretty that day and for a, a short time afterward. Amber said, cute, cute, cute. How do you know what plants can be separated without killing them? I think it's trial and error a little bit. You can tell though, if you, if you take a really close look at a plant, um, I was looking at one of the ferns because I wanted to split one of the ferns. And so you just kind of separate, you get down to the crown of the plant and you look, you know, to see if there's any separate crowns coming off, but everything seemed to be coming off the same crown. And so you can't separate that. Leptinella is a ground cover and so it just spreads itself around and so you can pretty much whack that wherever you want to and take a piece of it. And I think you just come to uh, learn the structure of plants and kind of how each one of them grows. 
Um, and then, yeah, I, I'm sorry I can't give you like a more pointed answer, but I think just a really close look at the crown, the top of the plant right above the soil will give you a lot of answers there. And that's it for today's recap video. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you're having a great week and we will see you in the next one. Bye.